We're back. This is His Word Unveiled. Um, okay, guys, we're in the story of Joseph. You know how excited I got last video. So ah, it's continuing, and I'm so excited. His Word is just so fresh. It's so, it doesn't matter how many times I've read this story. Like, there's always more to learn, there's always more to grab a hold of. So that is why I love the Word of God. You know, I can't read the same book over and over again. But the Word of God, I can because it, it's always different. God always reveals more and more. Um, no matter how many times you read it, that's the power of it. That's how it's alive and active and, and moving. It's so for real, guys. It's so for real. Okay, Genesis chapter 42 is what we are hitting today. So go ahead and read that. Um, take your time meet with the Lord. You know the drill. Um, be so purposeful, so intentional. Make it happen. Um, go do that. Go do your thing. And then we'll be back. Lord, thank you for yet another day that we get to read your word, another day that <clears throat> we acknowledge our freedom in just being able to worship you and cry out to you and praise you for your goodness, for how, how amazing you are, how deeply you love us. Lord, teach us. We want to learn more and more and more of you, more of your heart, more of the way that you do things and deal with things and, and provide for us. Lord, teach us, show us. I just want... I want to know your heart. I want to be so intimately connected with you. And I just pray that that happens in this time, that you just take me to a whole other level with you, a whole other place. Just take us on more and more adventures with you, showing us and revealing us, um, just unveiling your heart to us, unveiling your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Genesis chapter 42. So we just got talking about, uh, finished talking about in the last video, Genesis chapter 41, where the famine was happening like it was there and it was talking about that it was over the whole um was it over the whole face of the earth severe in the land of egypt the famine was severe in all the earth so we read that that this is like hitting so many people and not just egypt so then verse 32 42 i'm sorry now jacob saw that there was grain in egypt so this is jacob now we're talking about joseph joseph remember is second in command in Egypt, that Pharaoh raised him up, God promoted him, um, and used Pharaoh to raise him up in second in command. So Joseph is like it, like in the land of Egypt, like for real, super powerful right now. Then Jacob, so his father and all of his brothers are together. They saw that there's grain in Egypt. So everyone's hearing, hey, Egypt has grain and Egypt has you know, this and this and that. So Jacob is saying, why are you guys all just sitting around staring at each other? Go, get up, go to Egypt and buy us some grain. Let's go make this happen so we don't sit here and die. Um, so then it says, verse 3, um, the, Then ten brothers of Joseph went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers. For he said, I am afraid that harm may befall him. Now, guys, remember, Benjamin... Joseph and Benjamin were who the sons that Rachel bore to Jacob. So Jacob had that whole ordeal with Leah and Rachel. You know, Leah was given to Joseph out of deceit. Rachel is who um, Jacob loved. So we have Jacob and Rachel. Rachel, the only two sons that she bore were Joseph and Benjamin. Joseph then was, his father believes that he is dead because his sons his sons came back and deceived him and gave that coat of many colors, killed the goat, put the blood on it, and so deceived their father into thinking he was dead. And now he is holding tight to Benjamin, saying, look, I've lost Joseph. I cannot, I, I, I cannot let anything happen to Benjamin. So holding, holding tight to him. Um, so verse 5 says, So the sons of Israel came to buy grain among those who were coming, for the famine was in the land of Canaan also. So again, we see over the whole face of the earth, not just Egypt, but Canaan is being affected by it as well. So, so many people are just lining up, pouring into the land of Egypt, wanting to buy grain. Verse 6 says, Now Joseph was the ruler over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down to him, with their faces to the ground. Does that sound familiar, guys? Totally Joseph's dream, right? This is what the Lord relayed to him. And at this time, I mean, so we, what are we? Let's see, it was 13 years 
when he was 30, he was 30 years old. So he's, he was 17 when God gave him this dream. He was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh and interpreted that dream. Then we had the seven years of um, those seven good years where, where all of that grain was being brought up and kept held back and was stored up. So that was another seven years. So we're looking at like 20 years when the seven years of famine began. So I'm not certain, um, it, you know, if, if a year had passed or whatever, but we know at least 20 years has passed since God gave him that dream. Guys, 20 years. How many times does God give us a word or give us a dream and we just expect it to happen right away? Oh, God told me this or God showed me this. So, so this should be happening. And then we get impatient. And then we don't want to wait on the Lord because, because we're throwing out the God card and saying, God told me this and, and it should be happening and it's going to happen. And why isn't this happening and not letting anything stand in our way and trying to take matters into our own hands? When what God is saying was for real, what he's placed in your heart maybe or given you that dream or, or spoken over your life is for real. But we have to wait. We have to wait for God to release that and to allow that to, to happen, to, to come to pass, to come to play. So over 20 years, we see that Joseph waited to see this dream happen, to see that this was for real after all of his brothers were like mocking and saying, you know, you are so full of yourself. Like, how dare you think that his father even rebuking him and feeling this like, was it, you know, doubt had to have come. Like, was I wrong? Like, did I just dream that up myself? Was that from God? Did God show me that? Did God tell me that? Guys, we can't doubt these things and allow the mocking of the world or the rebukes of, of whatever. We can't allow what the world gives us and those voices to stifle what the Lord speaks to us, speaks clearly to us. We have to hold to that, even if we have to wait 20 years to see that come into fruition. Whatever it takes, however long it takes, if God speaks it, He is faithful. It will happen. It, it will come to pass. You know, I'm... Ooh, that hits me even speaking that out loud because the Lord spoke something super crazy big into my heart and I've been sitting on it for quite quite a while um you know and that that's just that's just God speaking that into my heart and just saying I am faithful like it will come to be I spoke that you know you you hear my voice you hear my voice don't doubt that when the Lord speaks receive it hold to it stand on it and wait Wait for him in such confidence that that it's not like your whole life's going to be put on pause until that happens. It's that now he's going to take you on this incredible process of growing you and developing you so that when it comes to be, when that thing happens that he has spoken will happen, and you will be ready for it. You will be in a place in your life and in relationship with the Lord in that growth where you are able to receive it in, in the most beautiful and authentic way where it can mean something, where you're not just hearing it, but it can mean something. It can actually do something in your heart. So over 20 years, and now Joseph is just seeing his brothers bow down to him. It says, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. They have no clue that this is Joseph. Joseph is in command. So they are rightfully gonna come and, and pay respect to to top dude in Egypt. You hear me? Like, do you hear that? Like he they don't know who it's Joseph. They don't know. But you can't tell me that Joseph's not thinking about that dream that God laid on his heart and said and showed, revealed to him that his brothers will come and be bowing down before him. That's just God and his faithfulness. No matter how long length of time does not determine that faithfulness. You know, if if God speaks it, it's going to happen. Hands down, nothing can stop it. Nothing, nothing can stop it. Okay, so verse 7, when Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he disguised himself to them and spoke to them harshly. I mean, guys, he looks like an Egyptian. He doesn't look like an Hebrew. He is wearing the clothing. He is, you know, his head, the whole fancy stuff that they wear. Like, like he is not recognizable. They have no clue that this is Joseph, but obviously Joseph recognizes his brothers. Um, just imagine the emotions, just the, the turmoil within himself of seeing them. And, and in his humanness then, we see, as you guys have read, we see that, that he accuses them of spies. He's, where you, where'd you guys fr come from? Who are you? You know, you must be spies. You're just coming here to spy out the land. 
And they're like, no, and they explain a little bit about who they are. Um, in verse 10, no, my Lord, but, my, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. Man, we are honest men. Your servants are not spies. They go in to talk about this is our father and we're, we're you know, brothers. There's 12 of us and, and one is no longer and one is not with us. Our youngest one, he's, he's back at home and Joseph is knowing. Joseph knows they're talking about Benjamin. That's his brother. And so he sees them all and he keeps accusing them, you know, in his humanness. I mean, he's got to be angry. These are the brothers that sold him, that hated him, that wanted to kill him and sold him. He is, he watched them throw him in a well and then sit back and eat lunch. Just sitting around eating bread, just talking, laughing, carrying on while he is there pleading for them to pull him out, pleading for them to, to spare his life. All of this going on. Joseph, you can't. You don't forget things like that. You don't forget forget the pain. And of course, we saw in the last chapter with Manasseh, you know, you can forget you can forget the pain in a sense that it's not it's not running your life. It's not plaguing your mind. You can forget it in a sense of hey, it's not running me. But it was done, and and those things leave scars. And those leave, those things that happen to us, they leave something there. And and Joseph, you know, he he remembers and he's struggling with this whole I have power to kill these guys right now. I have all the power, all all authority to do that. But the goodness of, of Joseph's heart and knowing that the Lord is with him and knowing that he is stuck with the Lord in this intimate relationship and this connection with him up until now, you start seeing this turmoil and you see him accusing them of spies. But then we see throughout um, this chapter and the chapters ahead, if you picked up on just the emotion, the emotion that he feels um, you know, at the same time, accusing them, but just wanting nothing more than to reveal himself and and hug on them or, or just confront them or so many emotions happening. So he's saying, you're spies, you're spies. He puts them in prison for three days. And in those three days, he has time to think. They have time to think. You know, then it says, um, verse 18, now Joseph said to them on the third day, do this and live for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined in your prison, but as for the rest of you, go carry grain for the famine of your households and bring your youngest brother to me so your words may be verified and you will not die. And they did so. So Joseph is saying, okay, I'm going to keep one of you in prison. If you guys can prove to me that you're not spies, which he knows they're not spies, he knows, but that humanness he doesn't know how to respond. He doesn't know how to act. How would you act? How would you deal with that situation when Joseph is sitting there with all the power in the world? And remember, back in Genesis chapter 41, verse 44, it says, Though I am Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one shall raise his hand or foot in all of the land of Egypt. Joseph was given power to get rid of these guys. Joseph is dealing with so much of wanting to get back with them, wanting to take vengeance, but also seeing them as his brothers and knowing that God is doing something. He is known because he's been willing and ready to be used by God through this entire, these entire 20 years. So he tells them, you're going to keep someone here and you're going to go back. If you want to prove yourself honest men, you're going to go back. You're going to leave your brother in prison. You're going to go back and get your youngest brother. You bring him to me and then we'll go from there. Um, we'll go from there. So then verse 21, then they said to one another, and here, here's where that conviction starts to soak in. Here, here's when God starts working on the brothers' hearts. Remember, after at least 20 years has passed, they say in verse 21, then they said to one another, truly we are guilty concerning our brother because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. Reuben answered them saying, did I not tell you, do not sin against the boy and you would not listen. Now comes the reckoning for his blood. So they think that Joseph is dead and they're thinking that all this is now happening because of how they treated Joseph. They did not know, however, this is verse 23, that Joseph understood for there was an interpreter between them. He turned away from them and wept. But when he returned to them and spoke to them, he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. So we see in verse 24, this turmoil of his love and compassion for his brothers, yet his, his humanness, 
these feelings that, that are coming about that are surfacing that he may have forgotten, but now he's face to face with them. He has to deal with this bitterness. He has to deal with this hurt, this betrayal, this, this anger that's swelling up within him. So he's saying, I'm going to keep one in prison. I'm accusing you of, of being spies. I'm doing all this. But then we see in verse 24, he turned away from them and wept. He hears that they are now distraught. They are, they are distressed and saying, all this is happening to us because of what we did to Joseph, because, because of how we treated him, because of how we didn't listen and have compassion on him, then we are being treated this way. So we see Joseph weeping and feeling his compassion, but also being very firm and saying, look, here's what's going to take place. Then we see Joseph's heart even more and not, you know, I'll show my brothers, I'll show them, I'll get back with them. It's not this acting upon this. He's acting in this confusion and wanting to do the right thing. We see this, but we see him then re restoring all of their money. He puts all of their money back in their bags, yet gives them grain, gives them food, gives them plenty. Restore every man's money in his sack. We see that in verse 25. So Joseph I mean, would you do that? Would you do that? That 10 of his brothers, 10 of his brothers mocking, hating him, throwing him in a well, laughing and just carrying on, selling him, selling him to the Ishmaelites, lying then to their father. I mean, guys, this is not just, this is not just calling their brother a name. This is serious stuff. And Joseph, we see, is weeping, feeling compassion for them, restoring their money, not, not stealing from them, not getting back at them, not, not oh my goodness, just the, the, the forgiveness, yet the humanness. That is, this is rich, guys. This, this, is, this is so, this is so rich. I hope you see that. I hope, man, I hope the Lord is doing something in you. Like, he surely is with me. Things are just stirring, stirring up. So then, um... One of them opens his sack on the way back to Canaan to his father. They realize that the money's in there and they freak out. And they're like, oh my goodness, what is this that God has done to us is what they're saying. They are feeling the shame um, from 20 years ago. They are still plagued with what they did with Joseph and now feeling this conviction and saying, oh, this is, you know, this is honest now because of what we've done. And they're saying, now we have money. Someone planted it in there saying that we, you know, that we're stealing it, that we never even gave it to them. Then they come back and they relay this to Jacob, their father. And they're saying, you know, we spoke to this man, the man in charge. He said all this. He said we had to bring back Benjamin and they kept Simeon. Um, so then 34, they, they, they speak this clearly. But bring your youngest brother to me that I may know that you are not spies but honest men. I will give your brother to you and you may trade in the land. So they're saying, look, we need to bring back Benjamin if we want more food. Then in verse 36, it says, Their father Jacob said to them, You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and you would take Benjamin? All these things are against me. Then Reuben spoke to his father, saying, You may put my two sons to death if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my care, and I will return him to you. But Jacob said, and this is how this chapter ends, but Jacob said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he alone is left. If harm should befall him on the journey you are taking, then you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow. So this chapter ends with Jacob saying, I am not letting you take Jacob from me. I lost Joseph. I lost Joseph. I'm not losing Benjamin. You are not taking him. And that's how the chapter ends. And we know then that the only way they are going back to Egypt and getting more food so that they can live, they and their family can live, is if they bring back Benjamin. And this ends with Jacob saying, no, you're not taking him. We're not doing it. We're going to live off what we have. We're good to go. You're not. My soul cannot. It says, then you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow if anything would happen to Benjamin, knowing that Joseph is dead assuming that Joseph is dead because of the lie that the brothers told him. So, so much good stuff. Yes, the story, like I said, is so rich and it's not even the end of it. We have so much more. Thank you for walking this out with me. I hope that you stick with me through this entire story, through the rest of Genesis even. Let's do this together. Let's keep growing. God is so good. He is so faithful. Choose to hear him speak. Hear his voice and stand on his word. Take him at his word. He is faithful and he loves you so much. Thanks for walking this out. I hope to see you soon.